Our next so speaker much. is Dr. J. Uh, Vijay Venkatraman. Dr. J. Vijay Venkatraman is a diabetologist, drug safety physician, and entrepreneur with more than two decades of experience. He holds an MBA degree in service management. Dr. Vijay is the first uh, Indian to have been conferred the Fellowship of the Pharmaceutical Information and Pharmacovigilance Association, UK. He has published several unique articles on a wide range of subjects. In 2012, Dr. Vijay founded Ovia MedSafe, a global pharmacovigilance consulting and drug safety services providing company based in India as well as in the UK and has functioned as its managing director and CEO since then. He holds several honorary leadership positions in professional associations in the pharmaceutical and healthcare domains. Dr. Vijay has been serving as Indian regional editor for Global Forum, a drug information association publication since 2017. He has been awarded for leadership excellence by the Indian Medical Association. Welcome, sir. Uh, welcome for this uh, conference. And uh, 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 now we are having your session. So over to you, sir. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, first yeah, of all, uh, yeah, thank you, madam. So first thank of all, let me thank you um, uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity, uh, Chinmaya and the entire uh, uh, Global PV Congress 2022 organizing team and, um, uh, and all the uh, supporting uh, members. Uh, this is a great opportunity uh, to be here and uh, in fact, more than opportunity, I would say it's a privilege to share the stage with uh, so many uh, uh, icons in the field of uh, pharmacogens. And uh, thanks to the chairpersons uh, and um, uh, for, the, for the kind introduction as well. So um, today I'm uh, uh, going to uh, talk about something a little different than what we are uh, usually uh, uh, talking. So this is more of uh, my... I would say perceptions and uh, projections as I how I would uh, want the, uh, the the PV industry and the pharma industry to um, see each other as partners. Of course, pharmacovigilance is a part of uh, the overall pharma industry, but still pharmacovigilance is not restricted only to the industry. And it is a science, uh, very exciting science as we have uh, seen since morning. The wonderful session since morning. So with this, um, I, I thought I will just take you through some thoughts and I also leave you with some thoughts. I'm not going to probably, this is something too early to think of in terms of uh, take home. I mean, even the take home messages will be questions from which you will have to actually start thinking. So I think we, we will start thinking today. That's what I wanted to do along with you uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes. And of course, I will be happy to take some questions. So um, I'll share my screen if that's okay with all of you. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I'm going to, uh, does it uh, mean, uh, are you able to see this in slideshow mode? Not yet. Yeah. yeah. Now. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah. We can. So, uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, so as I said, my topic, uh, what I chose when uh, Jinmaya reached out to me, I wanted to be slightly different. So I said, pharmacovigilance of the world and pharmacovigilance for the world, leveraging India's unique advantages. What I told him as a topic. I uh, apologize that the topic is too long, but I tried too hard. Uh, but I couldn't uh, abbreviate it any further um, because each and every word has a meaning and as you will see in the subsequent uh, slides. So uh, first of all, let me start with a disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed are, opinion, uh, are personal and do not necessarily reflect the official or policy or position of OVM and say for any organization. The logos and trademarks used are for education and awareness purposes only and there is no intention of corporate violation. Okay, now let's first talk about this pharmacy of the world. I know that uh, all of us have uh, really heard this uh, word during our, uh, uh, even uh, when we were probably students, 
20, 20 years or 30 years ago. Even then we have uh, heard this word, probably we would have said generic pharmacy of the world, uh, something like that. And uh, or probably we were talking about uh, the way we were uh, being the, um, the go-to pharmacy for uh, the, um, uh, the, what do you call the unregulated markets, so-called. And the, um, the markets were probably um, the other uh, foreign companies were, were not probably interested to uh, send their products maybe. In that context, we have heard, but I think we have gone, grown several notches uh, higher now. And uh, not only in terms of generics, uh, there, there are several areas where India actually leads the pharma world. So with that, let me go to the next slide. So you can uh, obviously uh, make out that India's domestic pharmaceutical market itself is huge. It's US dollar 42 billion, um, uh, according to our statistics. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to talk, talk about that. India as a global market. Everyone knows that. And that's why most of the global companies are also there in India. But uh, what we are uh, here talking about here, uh, what we are focusing here today is that India is a global pharma manufacturer for the world. So here, um, why this becomes important is because uh, we are ranking third in terms of uh, pharmaceutical production by volume. And in uh, August 2021, the interesting aspect is here. In July 2020, uh, the, uh, the pharmaceutical market, actually the market moved from 13.7% to 17.7% within a year. So that is a 4% increase. Despite the COVID, or probably we could even say COVID contributed to it in a way. Because we were, India as a country was really playing a huge uh, role at the time of the first wave when we were trying to uh, control the infection. And uh, in the second, uh, I mean, before the second wave when we were actually getting vaccinated and also obviously during the second wave, uh, it, it makes, uh, it's no secret that we were supporting through the second wave as well. So um, it is the 12th largest exporter of medical goods in the world and export stood at uh, US dollar 24.44 billion in 2021. And uh, we also have uh, um, the highest number of uh, drug manufacturers probably um, uh, we always say that as a great credential that uh, India is the country, uh, the only uh, country which has, or probably the second country which has the highest number of FDA approved manufacturing facilities outside the US. So that is uh, something uh, to be um, appreciated in the whole context. Often we see things like uh, there are so many findings in the um, GMP inspections and all that, but we must remember that uh, we'll have to see things in the context of the perspective that there is so much actually to uh, happening in India uh, from, for, from an exports perspective. And uh, obviously there are in a sheer matter of proportion, we are going to see quite a lot of uh, inspection findings and all. But what, what we must remember is even companies based in the US and elsewhere also, they are also having similar inspection findings only. So. Uh, it is something that we should see in the whole overall context that we are actually being a very important player in the global pharmaceutical uh, market. So we have uh, more than 60,000 branded formulations in India alone. And as I said, what Indian pharma industry does in India is not the focus here, but it, uh, it is also important because that says that we have the talent pool and that is why uh, we, have, we are able to uh, manufacture for the world. So. With this, let me go to uh, explain a little more about what we did during the pandemic. India was no short, nothing short of a messiah during the pandemic. So in, uh, as I said, during the first wave, uh, you may remember that uh, hydroxychloroquine became a very important drug during the first wave in 2020. So Indian companies exported hydroxychloroquine to 97 countries during the pandemic and it shipped 50 million tablets to the United States. And you may remember, not only United States, many countries had several ways of reaching out to India and in di different forms, they made appeals, requests and uh, whatnot to try to uh, get uh, drugs exported to them. So that shows we were indeed very important even at the stage when we did not have a vaccine. So then when we had a vaccine, what happened? As of May 2021, India supplied a total of 586.4 lakh COVID-19 vaccines. 
which comprises of grants, commercial exports, and exports under the COAX platform to 71 countries. And you can see Covishield, uh, which is uh, although it is uh, kind of uh, the uh, the the intellectual uh, property comes from uh, um, a foreign company and uh, along with the Oxford University, but uh, it is uh, India is the hub where it has been manufactured. And speaking of indigenous vaccine, yes, we have Covaxin, which was actually uh, indigenously developed by an Indian company. And more so, now we have Corby vaccine, several other uh, vaccines are there. So, which means that India is nothing short of uh, uh, delivering to the global market uh, pharmaceuticals and vaccines at a time. And this is a very recent example. We, As I told you, we have been talking about India being the generic uh, capital uh, uh, for manufacturing capital of the world, maybe in the 90s and the early 2000s itself, we have been speaking about that. But today, during the pandemic, last two years, what we have done shows that we are, as an industry, we keep growing. Okay, now enough about the pharma industry. Now, coming to why pharmacovigilance is relevant. So I want, uh, uh, I, I, do, I don't usually uh, use full sentences in my slides, but these sentences again are very important and uh, couldn't uh, I really couldn't make them uh, as bullet points because the sentences itself are quite pregnant with meaning. So uh, you, you, the first uh, let's look at the first point carefully. The pharma industry has existed for centuries, but safety was taken for granted until some disasters led to the birth of pharmacos. And so I'm sure all of you will relate to this because in the morning we had a wonderful session by Dr. J. Prakash sir, where he was talking uh, about the history of pharmacogens and how it has led to a uh, lot of knowledge. So unless we learn from a tragedy, it is bound to repeat. And uh, thankfully, we have learned a lot in the past 60 years, and that is why we have pharmacogens. What we must remember is properly performed pharmacogens activities help in augmenting the benefits while minimizing the risks associated with the medicines. So over the past 60 years, pharmacogens has made medicinal products much safer and more effective for the patients, thereby enhancing public confidence on the accountability of the industry. So this is a very important point because unless you say that you have, you admit that you are trying your best to help the patient. And if something goes wrong, you have a system to take care of it. Uh, that puts you as a very responsible, accountable uh, person and wins the public confidence. So obviously when we look at the history of pharmacogen, several uh, disasters have happened. And obviously, after the disasters, you generally, uh, the, uh, the common public, they lose scope about the system. So uh, how uh, we are able to regain that is only uh, by uh, treading the path of science. Of course, there are still some exceptions. You have conspiracy theories here and there. They, um, right and left, they, they are there around, you, around us as we speak. But uh, by and large, the scientific community has proven to the common public that we are actually uh, evidence-based medicine. And when you say evidence-based medicine, there are only two things which we focus. One is the safety and the other one is the effectiveness. In fact, everyone agrees that effectiveness may or may not be there, but safety is uh, something which cannot be compromised or bargained for. So pharmacogenesis is most relevant when we talk about the pharma industry and not just a minuscule compliance part. So that comes me, uh, brings me to the next slide. Is it uh, just a need to have compliance element? Without pharmacogens, the industry cannot function. And only for that purpose, it is there. It is not contributing anything more. And it's a mere compliance engine, is it something like that. Traditionally, we have unfortunately seen in uh, that way. It is conventionally seen as a cost center where without which it will not run. The business does not run without uh, uh, this department. So let's let pharmacogens department be there. And we will give salary to people working there and we will probably buy them all the stationary software and all that they want. But it is not going to give us money as it is. Whereas if I invest in marketing, it will bring me uh, bring my money back to me. So that is a profit center. This is a cost center. Traditional thinking. Unfortunately, uh, we are uh, losing the larger picture if we look at only the balance sheet in this context or profit and loss account in this context. So Regulatory reforms throughout the world have made semi-regulated markets more regulated with stricter implementation. If not, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't say this with any uh, lesser degree of uh, conviction. This is happening as we speak. 
most of the so called semi regulated markets have now moved to become regulation uh, regulated markets and the regulated markets are now even more stricter with the implementation and then if you look at uh, pharmacovigilance in the context of uh, unregulated markets previously used it used to be said that these markets are unregulated that's okay now it is not so even the so called unregulated markets have some kind of a pv requirement and what we need to remember is in many important markets where the pharma companies have their products sold uh, they cannot sell the products unless they show a minimum uh, pharmacovigilance standard globally like for example if you have to sell your product in uh, a developed market or in a market where you have a solid uh, pharmacovigilance requirement they also mandate that as a company you must have some responsibility and you must tell us what happens to your drug in um third world countries or uh, unregulated markets as you used to call them in the past uh, what happens there you must tell us otherwise you can't sell your drug here in our country which is a developed country so obviously things are changing and uh, um, previously also it used to be there it was on paper now these are becoming more uh, what do you call they this are getting implemented with more seriousness nowadays and uh, uh what, especially in the last two years what has happened is it is not just the regulators but all the stakeholders you see hcps you see the consumers everyone asks you uh, is covid vaccine safe can i take it is it uh, is it really helpful yeah people say that i won't uh, die of covid if i take a uh, vaccine but what if i die of the vaccine i'm sure many of you may have heard such questions and beyond all that only we have uh, india has achieved a very big vaccination uh, program success and that has made a covid free india possible i wouldn't say that without that it would be impossible but like like we have led the world in terms of the one of the um, uh, largest uh, or i would say the largest um, contemporary uh, vaccination programs in the world i think this has happened in india uh, and of course not without questions because when this even such uh, uh, such a program happens in a uh, such a high scale and people are bound to talk about uh, safety so much and never before has pharmacovigilance has been so much in focus uh, at the level of uh, consumers hcps researchers everyone talks about that and there are so numerous papers published about that so pharmacovigilance now in the future in the future any pharma industry uh, industry uh, player can never say that pharmacovigilance is not so important because everyone will ask you that question the peer pressure has already uh, been created and it is going to get even uh, bigger and um, even stronger if uh, if not stay at the same le same level so now let's come to pharmacovigilance for the world so uh, when i say this topic is again uh, i'm not all going to talk about indian pharmacovigilance requirements of course it was wonderfully uh, touched upon by uh, basu sir in the morning um, so here we are talking about how india performs pharmacovigilance for the world and then finally i will end with saying how these uh, both these strengths could be leveraged so now let's first look at why india uh, is important for pharmacovigilance so uh, for global pharmacovigilance as you all know uh, there are several uh, organizations which actually perform pharmacovigilance uh, activities on behalf of their clients and many of these clients are uh, foreign uh, companies pharma major major pharma companies actually and uh, the outsourcing industry over the past 15 years has grown so big in india that it employs thousands of people and this industry needs to be credited with the uh, with the point that it has created so many thousands of uh, pharmacovigilance professionals in a country where we had only few hundreds in uh, the um, uh, probably around the mid of uh, 2000s so and uh, i would like to um, acknowledge uh, dr pradeep anadi who made a mention of me uh, during her uh, talk thank you so much ma'am yes there, there are uh, uh, companies like us so many companies which are actually providing uh, pharmacovigilance services to the uh, for global compliance and uh, why this uh, puts india in focus is because uh, no other country has all these combinations uh, which you can see in the um, uh, in the slide uh, in front of you 
So India has many academic institutions which uh, focus on healthcare related courses. We obviously get uh, the out outcome of those institutions are trainable manpower in, uh, I mean, in terms of HCPs uh, who are uh, uh, doctors, pharmacists and other uh, healthcare professionals who are available for the pharma industry. Scalability and uh, India, like sheer population, we have so many people, like if you want to hire 300 people in one month, you can still do it. That is uh, possible in India, which is not possible in any other country. And English is as the lingua franca. What I mean is that India is uh, one country where um, all kinds of scientific and business studies happen in English. Unlike uh, the, even the European countries, you can't uh, have uh, people so fluent in English as we are. I'm, I'm talking about non-UK Europe, obviously. So uh, that uh, gives rise to a very big uh, advantage to India. And we have a low operational cost compared to the European countries and the US and uh, North America in general. And what we have as a very big strength is our IT expertise. And you know, in the 90s, uh, IT boom has actually uh, put us in a very good position uh, as a country that we are uh, able to um, innovate in uh, IT very comfortably, uh, even uh, better than our uh, European or uh, North American counterparts that we have uh, uh, cost effectively implemented IT uh, in several industries and uh, pharmacovigilance is no, not an exception. And in fact, that's a very fascinating point that has made uh, pharmacovigilance affordable for India and India uh, suitable for pharmacovigilance. So uh, what are the types of pharmacovigilance outsourcing in India? There are large business process outsourcing companies uh, which uh, focus on the um, activities, transactional pharmacogens activities like literature monitoring and uh, uh, the case processing, huge volume, uh, but very focused activities. And then you have contract research organizations which perform pharmacogens in a more holistic manner, but uh, they derive it primarily from the clinical trial stages and they take it into the uh, post-marketing stages as well. So you, the uh, contract research organizations uh, are um, uh, focusing more in pharmacogens and you have standalone pharmacogen service providers which uh, do only pharmacogens and, and are focused only on pharmacogens alone. And the, as a company, they don't do anything other than pharmacogens. So normally you hear of full service CROs and uh, CROs focusing on certain areas alone. We don't, uh, I don't prefer to call PV service provider as a CRO because probably more than 90% of the work would come from post-marketing, whereas a contract research organization, uh, the terminology is more suitable to clinical trials. So in that way, pharmacogen service providers are a distinct entity. And pharma companies, global companies, uh, on their, uh, they have their own uh, captive units uh, set up in India. India has been very successful in uh, helping global pharma companies, foreign pharma companies also set up their R&D um, uh, uh, units in India. Similarly, for pharmacovigilance, the, it has uh, now become the norm. At least uh, four or five pharma companies have set up uh, huge hubs for pharmacovigilance, uh, along with other areas as well, medical writing and other related areas in uh, major cities like Hyderabad, Bangalore, and uh, Chennai. So we have uh, such uh, things happening here. And last uh, but not the least, PV automation, AI and tech developers are also having India in the uh, uh, India as their uh, one of their main hubs. If you may remember, uh, there was one company which was supporting U UK MHRA for their uh, COVID adverse uh, events monitoring. And that uh, company was branded as, although it's a, it's an American company, it was branded as India made product uh, protecting UK citizens uh, from COVID, uh, uh, I mean, adverse events related to COVID drugs. So that's how it was positioned at the global scale. So that much of uh, credibility we have developed as a country in the PV outsourcing space. So obviously I have not talked about Indian pharma companies operating globally here because they don't usually outsource. They have their own in-house setups. They have developed their own um, setups uh, to perform global pharmacogens activities uh, in uh, centered in India itself. So 
to uh, to uh, put things in perspective um, india is uh, nothing less than the mecca of global pv operations we have global pharma uh, majors as i said they are outsourcing pv activities to companies which have teams based in india and uh, sometimes they also set up their own captive units as i just said now and you have indian multinational companies which i didn't cover in the previous slide they have, they establish in house global pharmacovigilance and it 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 it, uh, it doesn't mean that they don't outsource they also seek support from india based service providers when needed but in general um, indian companies prefer to develop their own uh, uh, setup and uh, um, i mean with with all the advantages and uh, with the service providers are also being in india it it is probably easier and more economical to, for pharma companies to develop on their own but i must add one word here not all the uh, companies which export uh, their drugs to other countries the indian companies not all of them have the uh, the capacity or uh, the expertise to or probably the bandwidth to actually set up something in pv and uh, run it uh, so they do seek end to end service providers support also so now uh, coming to the last couple of slides um, as i said i am going to just leave you with some thoughts uh, what are the unique advantages which we should actually leverage so uh, point number 1 what is you should remember is setting up a global pv unit in india is convenient quick and economical this combination again no other country can provide so does this mean that there is a challenge in compliance no successful audits and uh, inspections Vouch for India's strength in global PV. In fact, uh, uh, compared to the GMP inspections, from a GVP inspection point of view, our findings and in, uh, in audits and inspections are not anything uh, lesser than what they would get in other uh, markets. Of course, GVP is for EU. If you look at the North American and other uh, uh, inspection inspectors as well. still the findings are uh, pretty much same on what happens on the other side of the world and uh, what we have understood is that investing in pv early in the life cycle of a pharma company has its reward like you embed pharmacovigilance as a strategic part of your organization that always helps you when you grow because when you look at uh, the market companies with solid pv systems are seen as science focused quality conscious patient centric and responsible i want to use these words very carefully because uh, when you have uh, um, see, even you are a patient you want to take a medicine you obviously go to a branded uh, um, drug and you always trust the company in some way or the other and even if something goes wrong you tell the company they take it seriously they work on that and they come back to you with a feedback you you feel that you are uh, you are being uh, treated as important by the company so and if they deal with science uh, and they, whatever their responses and how the things happen and in general how you are satisfied with the drug makes you think that this company is science focused this company is quality conscious and therefore it is patient centric and responsible so this is a very important factor for pharma companies to uh, brand themselves not only locally in the international sense as well and therefore without this uh you will not be able to sustain in the long run as a uh, so this is a um, uh, the point i was trying to make i told you in the, i i will uh, connect in the end that earlier people used to think that this is something uh, pharmacogens is something just uh, for the purpose of complaints you need to have nobody bothers about it no it is actually directly concerning your own consumers your own customers so any company would want to keep its customers happy so a pharma company with a good pv system is actually mandatory for keeping its customers happy so when you look for uh, next thing is when you go for uh, global partnerships uh, a company say if you are an indian company you want to export to uh, 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 drugs abroad you need partners and you see partners value companies with better uh, proper pv in place and when you are a partner for a global innovator and you are partnering as a generic uh, company you partner with them uh, to to market their products within india then also if you have a proper pv in place you are better val uh, valued and uh, we must also remember such uh, kind of partnerships have happened 
uh, very successfully in the past 10 15 years and uh, only companies which are having good pv systems have really won these uh, kind of contracts and litigation related losses also fall if you have proper pv in place because nobody here is vouching that everything will be safe for everyone all the time uh, but if something goes wrong what system do we have in place what preparedness do we have in place i think this defines how businesses uh, grow and uh, having said that we uh, although it's not directly relevant i will also say this india also have some requirements uh, pharmacovigilance requirements solid requirements nowadays so any global company which gives you a contract to uh, market your products within india they will also expect that you take care of the local obligations and you have your own uh, pv setup in place so it can be your own or it can be outsourced but it should be properly governed and you, it should uh, fulfill the compliance requirements and you should be answerable and uh, you should be successful in any audit or inspections so in other words pharmacovigilance is an insurance policy uh, we all think why should we pay insurance uh, policy like i think it's going to happen right but that's only a hopeful thinking wishful thinking but when something goes wrong only you realize you should have taken the policy earlier um, so that's way in that way having uh, pv always secures the pharma industry so finally this is my last slide to conclude indian pharma industry has a bright future no doubt india holds a leadership position in the global pharmacovigilance domain this has been proven a few years ago itself but now post covid we see that with we have been doing uh, a lot of um, uh, safety monitoring for covid vaccines during trials and immediately uh during the emergency authorization phase and post marketing everything we are doing so we are having that leadership position it's everyone has to accept that today the entire world has to accept that today and the combined benefit is a key strength that should be leveraged for india to scale much greater heights so without pharmacovigilance it is evident that the pharma industry cannot grow i'm using this word very strongly it cannot grow today because consumers and everyone is now aware and with the growth of the pharma industry pharmacovigilance becomes even more relevant obviously isn't it because the more drugs uh, you know, patients take the more adverse effects are going to happen and it becomes more and more relevant so i'll be happy to take questions and uh, i would like to thank you uh, and i hope these thoughts were relevant and uh, uh, you uh, in uh, uh, i believe this will help you start thinking in these lines and probably 5 years later we are talking of this uh, topic as a success story as how india successfully leveraged both these uh, industries and the relationship between them for uh, a much uh, taking both the industries uh, to be very successful in the longer run thank you so much uh thank you sir very interesting session i really agree that this session is totally different and it gives a lot of information to everyone and i, I think india will also lead in pharmacovigilance to the global pharmacovigilance reporting and uh, adr monitoring also so if uh, anybody is having questions audience please type the question in the chat box so there is one question uh could you say something about material material vigilance career okay material vigilance and a carrier perspective out of it okay okay so it's a very interesting aspect uh, material vigilance obviously uh, see in general uh, whatever products we use for medicinal purposes have to be monitored everyone agrees with that so material vigilance is uh, nothing but uh, the spe specialized field of pharmacovigilance which deals with medical devices so this is becoming much more important than in the past because um, now you don't have just the mechanical machines but you have the electronic machines also coming into the picture today to treat various conditions to monitor various conditions across the world and the, there are requirements uh, across um, the world for several uh, 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 i mean the material vigilance requirements are there and uh, you have uh, i mean recently in the uk and eu we have very clear uh, guidelines that have come into place and uh, not uh, anything uh, lesser than that we have our own material vigilance program of india where 
it has uh, started uh, the, the program has given recommendations for us uh, as to what um, uh, kind of monitoring should be there in place and um, there are uh, requirements for the industry as well from the indian perspective also so uh, coming to the career path yes it's a very interesting uh, um, career to be there it uh, the only thing is the skill set may be slightly different and uh, if, uh, material vigilance could be far more specialized. Like um, when you look at pharmacovigilance, unlike you have, uh, I mean, unless you have something very specific, like you are uh, looking into the safety of a particular therapeutic area or something. In general, uh, otherwise pharmacovigilance is something which anyone can uh, handle if they have good, good pharmacovigilance experience. But in terms of material vigilance, your knowledge of how that particular machine works and how that uh, actually contributes to the uh, patient safety is very important. Apart from the core principles of material vigilance and understanding of the therapeutic area for which that particular machine is used and how that is going to, that device is going to help the patient and what it is supposed to do, that understanding and knowledge is much more important than it is for pharmacogenes. I'm not saying it is not important for pharmacogenes, but I, uh, in pharmacogenes, you require the, such kind of knowledge only when you're doing uh, complex tasks like signal management or risk management, probably for case processing or even during the, to a certain extent in aggregate reporting, you don't need that much knowledge about the product itself. But in material vigilance, it's uh, even for a basic activity, you need to know more about that. So um, that's a very specialized area and uh, it has a very good future. Dr. Vijay, what would you be uh, saying about the previous speaker's uh, uh, presentation of automation and uh, pharmacovigilance? How much automation is going to change the scenario in India here? <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. That's a, that's a very important uh, question and everyone has that question. Uh, pharmacovigilance, uh, material vigilance, whatever it is, like um, not only this field, in general, today we have so many uh, automotive uh, activities, even in our uh, mobile phone, uh, you have so much of automation in place. And day to day, uh, I mean, we are talking about internet of things uh, that is going to be the future. So when everything is like that, we cannot uh, say pharmacogenes alone can be free from in, uh, automation. In fact, automation and artificial intelligence are very helpful when you want to mine large quantities of huge quantities of data and uh, you want to take meaningful yield out of it. Say if you have to go through one lakh records and you find one record is relevant, it is uh, a waste of human effort to do that. But what if that one record is important? With automation or artificial intelligence, you can do that. You, that one record is also saved. I mean, that, uh, that one record information is also retrieved. But at the same time, uh, valuable human time is uh, available for much bigger things. So in, in terms of jobs, I believe initially there will definitely be a loss of jobs. But what we must remember is that, um, uh, I mean, we, we, we see th that this is coming. So we need to equip ourselves in the overall scheme of pharmacovigilance and understand the bigger things in pharmacovigilance, be ready for uh, a more holistic pharmacogens uh, roles rather than stick to basic activities which can be automated. We all agree that not all activities ca can be automated. Okay. So uh, there are skills, human skills required always. So we need to upskill ourselves and be, uh, make sure that we are res resilient enough to uh, fight back this initial phase because once we cross this phase, there will be a lot more activity to be performed because much more data will be uh, read by these machines and you will have a lot of data. And from those uh, data, you will have meaningful uh, information and that meaningful information has to be analyzed. And for that, we need people. So in the long run, definitely this is going to help and technology is there to support us to uh, ensure better patient safety. And I don't think that is something to be worried about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, a very informative session.